This morning we're beginning a new series considering the New Testament book of 1 Peter. So please do turn to 1 Peter with me. Um, we're not going to have another reading, uh, but it will just be helpful to have 1 Peter in front of you as there are a few references that I'm going to make. And as we consider 1 Peter together, I hope this will be helpful for us as we seek to do what the early church did. Remember when Peter preached at Pentecost in the power of the Holy Spirit and many were converted and the sign that they were converted was what they went on to do. They were baptized and they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to prayer, to the breaking of bread and to fellowship. This book of 1 Peter is the Apostles' Doctrine, isn't it? It is the teaching about God and the way of salvation which the Apostle Peter has faithfully written down. So if you look at the first verse, we have those words, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And for this message, we're not going to go any further than that. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so what I want to do, I want us to consider today something of the man, Peter the man. Uh, who was this man behind the book that, uh, God willing, we will consider? And then, God willing, uh, next Sunday, I think it is, uh, we will then consider some themes that arise out of 1 Peter. So we've got these things in our mind as we uh, um, uh, go through this book together. So we, uh, as we consider Peter, um, what I want us to think about is the fact that he was a man who had a testimony. Now, a, a testimony is something that every Christian believer has. It is, if you like, their story of God's working in their lives. And whilst our story is not Peter's story, Peter's story is not our story, there are similarities because Peter's story is written down for us in order that we might see how God works savingly, graciously in the life of a sinner to bring them to salvation. And so that's what I want us to do because this is something that God is still doing. God is still in the business of graciously saving souls. And so as we look at the life of Peter, if we're believers, we can see similarities in our own experience. And if we're not, may it help us to call out upon the Lord that we too might be saved. So first of all, Peter, the follower. The first uh, encounter with Peter in the scriptures, uh, we meet him by a different name. He's introduced to us as Simon when his brother Andrew brings him to meet Jesus. And we see this in John chapter 1, where, uh, where we've just been. As one of John the Baptist's disciples, Andrew, heard John the Baptist say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. On hearing this, he did the best thing that he could possibly do with the information. He found his brother to tell him the good news. John chapter 1 verse 41 says this, we have found the Messiah. What a wonderful thing to do with the good news, to find our nearest and our dearest and to tell them we found the Messiah, we found the one who gives us hope. And then we read in verse 42 of John chapter 1, and he brought him to Jesus. What a wonderful phrase. I wonder, have we tried to bring somebody to Jesus? It's the best thing that we can do on finding the Messiah. And right at the beginning of Peter's story, God's saving grace was seen in the fact that somebody else brought him to Jesus. Perhaps you can relate to that. 
Perhaps you were searching for the things of God. You, 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 you wanted to know. God had already put it in your hearts to want to know and to believe and, uh, and to search. Perhaps you weren't. Perhaps you had no interest whatsoever. Perhaps you had no contact with the things of God whatsoever. But then God brought somebody into your life who brought you to Jesus. Perhaps it was a parent or somebody that you got to know who then became a spouse or a friend. Perhaps it was from young or, or as you were older. But somebody brought you under the sound of the gospel and you heard. We give thanks for those people, don't we? Because God put them into our lives in order to bring us under the sound of the gospel. Peter's story started with an introduction to, to Jesus. And there is a similarity there because there is no salvation outside of faith in Jesus Christ. And he was brought to the Lord Jesus. But it didn't stop there. Because as soon as Jesus met Simon, he immediately gave him a new name. This is not the only person that this has happened to in the scripture. We think of Saul, who becomes Paul. We think of Abraham, who becomes Abraham. We think of Sarai, who becomes Sarah. This is something that God does. And whilst he may not change our outward name, he changes us on the inside. And this is the point. John chapter 1, verse 42. Now when Jesus looked at him, studied him, saw this man, Simon. He said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. I know you. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Cephas is the Aramaic for stone or rock, which in Greek is Peter. But why this change? Because, as I've already said, Jesus was going to do something transformative in Peter's life. He was going to make a change, a change for the better. The new name spoke of the new heart and the new direction that Jesus was going to give him. Peter was going to be born again. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, see it there. He writes about it. He was going to be born again through the word of God. God's word came to him, and by the Spirit, something was wrought with him. Life was given, and he was brought to new life, and a change was wrought. Not only was Jesus going to take the often impulsive and proud Simon and make him into the humble and solid Peter, but he was going to bring him out of death and into life, and out of the domain of Satan and into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. He was going to forgive him and cleanse him and completely change him. I wonder, has that happened to you? Because that's what Christianity is all about. It is about knowing the reality of our sins forgiven and of a change being wrought in us, which is ongoing. It's knowing justification, that we've been justified, uh, forgiven from all of our sins, that at the cross our sin was imputed to Christ, put upon him, and his righteousness was imputed to us. And in the sight of God we are declared righteous. But it's not just that, it's being adopted into his family so that now by faith in him we are children of God. And it's that that work of sanctification has begun in us and will continue in us until the day that we die or he returns because something decisive has happened. We've been born again. This is what happened in Peter and it is true of every single believer. But why did God, Christ, the Lord Jesus, do this work in Peter? It was for a purpose. And we read about that, and I'm jumping around, you can come with me or just listen, in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19. This was Peter's next meeting with Jesus. 
Peter was a fisherman by trade. And as he was out fishing with his brother on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus came by and said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The first thing that Jesus did was to call him to himself, to call Peter to himself. Follow me. Don't go out and be useful. Follow me. Not because he could see great potential in Peter, but because he loved him. He wanted him for himself. He wanted to save him. And the first thing that the Lord Jesus says to us as individuals here today, and he is continuing to say to us, is, follow me. But then he told him what he was going to make him. And this wasn't something that Peter was going to do for himself. It was what the Lord Jesus was going to make him. A fisher of men. Instead of catching literal fish, Peter was going to reach out to people and see them saved and brought into the kingdom of God. He was going to exchange his nets for the word of God and he was going to preach and he was going to draw people into the kingdom of God. Jesus was going to change Peter's life for the better, forgiving his past and giving him hope for the future. But in so doing, he was going to bless others through Peter. And that is true of all of God's children. We are blessed in order that we might bless others. I remember when I had the uh, the induction service here at Boris Park. I remember it very clearly, Mark in the pulpit here with me, praying that the Lord would bless us in order that we might bless others. Wherever the gospel is preached, Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, is calling sinners to repentance. And that is happening here this morning. It's happening all over the world where the gospel is preached. Christ is saying, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Come and be blessed that you in turn may bless others. Peter, by the grace of God, was a follower of Jesus. But secondly, Peter was a failure. Having been called by Jesus, Peter left his livelihood and his family and he became a devoted disciple. In fact, as we well know, if we know anything of the scriptures, he was the leader of the pack. If there was a question that was on the minds of the disciples, then nine times out of ten, it was Peter who asked it. Somebody has called him that the disciple with the foot-shaped mouth because he always put his foot in it. And if there was an answer that needed to be given by the disciples, then it was Peter, nine times out of ten, that gave it on behalf of the disciples and to Jesus. But though he was devoted and a natural leader, very often his discipleship was mixed and accompanied by miserable failure. Remember on the water, Jesus walked on the Sea of Galilee and Peter said, Lord, command it and I'll come out. He had faith. He went out. What did he do? He looked at the wind and the waves and he began to sink. When Jesus asked his disciples, uh, when everybody else was confused as to who Jesus was uh, and who do you say that I am, it was Peter who responded by saying, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But it wasn't long after that great and wonderful confession from the lips of Peter that he then went on to try and stop Jesus from going to the cross. He was the mouthpiece of Satan. The very same person who had confessed that he was Christ then tried to stop him from doing what the Christ must do, which was die on the cross to save sinners. He failed. And then when others deserted Jesus in droves, it was Peter who said on behalf of the twelve, the Lord said to him, will you desert me also? And Peter said, Lord, 
to whom should we go? It's wonderful, isn't it? To whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to see and to know that you are God. But then it was Peter, along with the rest, who, when Jesus was arrested, fled. He knew what was right. He stood for it. He failed. But perhaps the failure that Peter is most remembered for for is his denial of the Lord three times. Jesus had told him that on the night that he would be betrayed, that Peter would deny him three times. And Peter's response is cringeworthy because we see ourselves in it. In proud defiance, he said, not me, Lord. I'll never deny you. I'll never turn my back on you. All will run away, but I would rather die with you. But when an angry mob arrived to take Jesus away, and when the Lord Jesus rebuked him for reacting with violence, all of his courage faded away. And in a fight or flight situation, he started with fighting and then in faithlessness, he fled. And then he denied that he ever knew his Lord. And worse still, he did it in the face of a servant girl. The man who was to be a rock for God, you will be Peter, a rock, was putty in the hands of Satan. What a reminder to us that even if we are converted, we need to be sober and on guard. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober-minded. Be vigilant. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking somebody to devour. Resist him, verse 9. Firm in the faith. Peter could write that from bitter experience, knowing that not only had he been the mouthpiece of Satan, but he had denied his Lord in the face of a servant girl. But even though he was a failure, and even through his failures, God was graciously at work in his life. And this is the wonder of grace. That as we look back over our lives and we see sinful failure, and perhaps the older we get, the more acutely and the more terrible it is to us, we also see another strand. We see the grace of God. Because where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. This is God's way. He saves and keeps all those that he calls to himself. And you'll notice that this is all of God, even though they fail him. Before Peter's great fall, Jesus had said in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, Strengthen your brethren. God had a plan for good even in Peter's miserable failure. The Lord is able to overrule our failures by his grace and power for his glory. Does this mean that we can go off and sin? By no means. Paul deals with that argument. That's not how we're to treat grace. We are to run away from sin. We're to resist the devil. We're to recognize with Joseph that how can I do this great sin against God? We're to recognize after we've sinned with David that our sin is only against God. But as we repent, we take comfort that underneath and all around are the everlasting arms of God's grace. God had a plan for good, even in Peter's miserable failure. The sin and failure was all Peter's, 
But the faith to return and strengthen his brethren came from God. And so after the resurrection, as Peter had failed Jesus three times, so Jesus asked Peter if he truly loved him. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Yes, feed my lambs. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Yes, tend my sheep. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Tend my sheep. Was he trying to belittle him, make him feel small, accuse him? No, for every sin that he had committed, he was showing that he was fully forgiven and accepted. And for every sin that we have committed, if we are in Christ, they're all forgiven. In no way did our Lord belittle him or humiliate him, but he showed him how much he was loved and forgiven. And he made him ready to go out and serve. You know, the most usable people in the kingdom of God are those who are the most assured of their forgiveness. Because it is reckoning on God being with us that we will expect great things of God and attempt great things for God. So here he was, a failure, but God was still at work in him. And so turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3. Because is it any wonder that Peter wrote about tasting that the Lord is gracious? I wonder, have you tasted that the Lord is gracious this morning? Not just that God is good and he is gracious, but that he has been good and he is gracious to you, a sinner. This is something that cannot be understood from the outside. To taste, you have to take it to yourself. And Peter's writing to us is full of his own experience because in the midst of his failure, he had tasted that the Lord is gracious even though I denied him even though I failed him even though I was a mouthpiece to Satan the Lord was gracious have you tasted that the Lord is gracious even in failure God was at work to save Peter but finally we need to see Peter the faithful Because ultimately, failure won't get us to heaven. God saves us and he keeps us and he makes us faithful. The Peter we read of in the book of Acts is a transformed man. He witnessed his Lord's ascension into glory, an eyewitness of his majesty. He was devoted to prayer with the others in the upper room, pleading, Lord, keep your promise, send your spirit, do your work, advance your kingdom, prayers that we can all pray. He was filled with the spirit on the day of Pentecost and with a new boldness in the face of many made girls, probably, and people of all society in the same city who only a week earlier had crucified the Lord he proclaimed salvation in Jesus Christ. Nothing could stop his preaching, not imprisonment, not persecution. In fact, these became further opportunities for him to take the gospel out. Even the difficulties were the bumps that he climbed on in sharing the good news of the gospel. And the Lord greatly used him as an apostle to lead and shepherd and feed the flock which was the very thing that the Lord had encouraged him to do at the time that he had forgiven him for his sins. And so past failure does not preclude us from present usefulness. If we are forgiven, the Lord is still calling us to follow him and he will make us fishers of men. 
He traveled through Judea and Palestine and Syria and into Asia Minor to expand and to strengthen the church. Was he a perfect man and the finished article? No. On one occasion, the Apostle Paul had to rebuke him, uh, even in front of others. How embarrassing to uh, rebuke the leading apostle, Peter. He'd been sitting and eating with Gentiles, showing that they were one in the faith, that, that the gospel had broken down the wall of hostility between even Jews and Gentiles. And then some Jewish Christians from Jerusalem came and he separated himself from the Gentiles. But despite this, the evidence of Christ's preserving and sanctifying grace was still with him because later in Acts 15, when a council was brought on this very issue, it is Peter who stands with Paul in order to say that all are one in Christ because God was at work in his servant and he is continuing that work in all of his children. Early church historians indicate that he probably died as a martyr around A.D. 65. Some people think that he was crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified the same way as his Lord. Not sure about that, but it is probably the case that he was martyred for the faith. He was faithful to the end. What a testimony to God's saving grace. One thing that we can be sure of today, this morning, is where Peter is. He is face to face with his Lord. The enduring evidence of this faithfulness is not only in what is written about him, the testimony of his life, but also in what is written to us in his letter. Verse 1 again, chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle. What grace. Peter, an apostle. What grace of Jesus Christ. For those of us who know the Lord, Peter was a man like us. He was a sinner, saved by the grace of God in Christ. And like us, he experienced the struggles and the triumphs of the Christian life. He was a sinner saved by grace. And so as a brother in Christ, he writes to us as one who knows and understands. And so as we come to this, if we are believers, we don't need to be condemned by it. We need to allow his words to speak to us. And if we're not yet Christians, we need to allow his words to challenge us because he too was a sinner needing saving. And if we're sitting here and we think we're Christians and we're not yet, then we need to hear this word and allow it to challenge us and speak to us in our deepest heart and life. Because through his faithful witness, we hear the voice of God himself. As an apostle, he was a witness to Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection. But he was also used to bring the revelation of God to us. So when Peter speaks, God speaks. Think of some of the wonderful things he says. Chapter 1, verse 3. That there is living hope for sinners. Why? Look at it. Verse 3, chapter 1 through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Chapter 1, verse 10, that salvation has come to us, and how has it come to us? In the coming of Christ. Chapter 1, verse 19, that the way of our redemption, that the way that we're saved, that the way that we're rescued from our sin and brought from hell into heaven is not by the payment of silver or of gold or of good works paid to God in the hope that he will accept us, but by the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. Or chapter 3, verse 18. That Christ suffered for the sins of his people, the just one, the righteous, the holy, for the 
unjust, for sinners, for rebels. And why? Chapter 3, verse 18, that he might bring us to God. This is from the voice of an apostle and from the voice of a sinner saved by grace. Chapter 5, verse 5, that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And chapter 5, verse 10, for those who are suffering and struggling and fighting in trial and temptation, that the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a while, will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. The reality that God speaks today is a wonderful thing. And that he speaks in this letter to us should quiet us in reverence and fill us with eager anticipation as to what the Lord has to say to us. That as we come to this book written by Peter, a man changed and transformed by Christ, God has something to say to us. Isn't God good? He was gracious to Peter, and in and through Peter's faithful witness, his grace is available to us. And the grace of God in Christ brings salvation, which brings peace in a way that is right before Almighty God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the life story and the testimony of the Apostle Peter. Uh, Lord, he, he almost could be standing here sharing his testimony before being baptised, because like us, uh, he was a sinner and saved by grace. Uh, Lord, for those of us who do not know you yet, please help us to consider seriously Peter's life, his testimony, and what you did in him. Thank you for the reality that Peter is now in glory, awaiting the resurrection of the dead. And Lord, pray that we would be ready for that great day of your return. Uh, Lord, minister to us, and as we consider this book together, Lord, speak to us and do us good and glorify your name amongst us. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.